good news for all of you. We are live. Okay, we're muted. Let's see what we see. Okay, I want somebody to walk in front of the camera. Yay! Okay, stand there. No, don't move. Let's see if you appear all of a sudden. No obscene gestures to the camera. Even though, do we have to chat? And we have chat! Okay, it's not working. <laughs> You've broken the internet. <laughs> Whoops. Whoops. That happens. Oh, you're here! It works! <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's about 20 seconds behind. Okay, I still don't have a monitor, so I might have to use my phone. Has anyone done this? Have a, the little photo ID thing? And you... And <laughs> yeah, it doesn't like the mask. Okay, I'm going on YouTube. I hate not seeing what I'm doing. I'm not going to buy YouTube Premium. Yeah. There I am. <laughs> there I am whining about the mask. All right. <laughs> Okay, I'm on. Yes, I know I'm on. This is so exciting. Okay, so, uh, was that as much fun as it seemed? Okay, while I am <laughs> one person, mm -hmm, yeah, whatever. Okay, everyone take out your uh, notes for chapter one and two. And while you do that, I'm going to take roll. If you are kicked off of the of team, please let me know as soon as possible. It is kicking people off. It is putting different people in class. Uh, I've had four people have been kicked out of my classes so far today. Out of team, you're still like technically in class. So we are a day. Need you here, Daisy. You're here. Rachel, you're here. Isaac, you still here? I'm right here. Emma. Hi. Lauren, good. So, it's Becca, right? Yeah. Good. And Harley, I gotta go through everybody and mark you here. Jacob, Logan, Reed, are you still here? And Marley, good. Okay, that's gonna be a total pain. I'm gonna whine a little bit more. Do you feel my pain? Not a bit, huh? Any questions, anything you could not find on your notes for chapters one and two? Yes? <laughs> yeah, I know the math. I really want to say Ikamedia, but that's not right. Ikamienda. Yeah. Okay, so that is, uh, those are essentially Spanish plantations in New Spain. And the American Indians who lived there would basically be slaves. Even though they would not, well, it was complex. We'll just put it as slaves. But it's the way they did the plantations. And if you go to one of the nice little plantations in the U.S. South, they're just big slave there. Anything else we could not find on that? One more? Awesome! Yes? Roanoke Island. Roanoke Island. In fact, I was going to talk about that uh, a little bit here, but it was the first attempted British colony. It was 1585, and it disappeared. Because it was right when the United States, or parts of the United States. Britain was at war with Spain. And so they couldn't check on it for a while. When they came back, basically everybody was gone except for one word, Croatoan. They almost certainly joined the interior tribes. Almost certainly. There was Croatoan trouble. Any other ones we could not find? All right. This is
will be fun. Make sure your name is on it. And stick it back in the third period box. Yes. Why? We just get to me tomorrow. We're, we're all getting into the swing of things. Sure. The book, the book is a little better. You know, the internet will be safety. Depends where you look. Yeah. Um, probably look at things on the internet. You get my little back notes, little trivia notes. Where the book really does a pretty good job uh, trying to get his narrative and trying to connect things. And so if you just look up little fact notes, yeah, problems. Just like we, I try to connect everything when I. Okay, next. The Zen Chapter 2, I was going to collect tomorrow, this, and so if you have it, it's done, don't worry about it. Does everyone have the Zen Chapter 2? You know what I'm talking about? You don't? Were you not here on Thursday? I was here, but it doesn't mean I retained it. Huh? I, I was here, but it doesn't mean I retained it. Wow. <laughs> That's a rapid short-term memory. Did you pick it up? Did I hand us out the Zen, or did you pick up the book? Uh, yeah, I gave you a little pack with the three chapters in it because I printed it out. Oh, oh yeah, that's in there. What was the book that I said? Read the first chapter and the top. I hope this will not become a habit. Well, I I was just kind of going through the motions right now. Okay, make sure you write things down. Get things down. Okay, so you have two questions. One, two, four, and seven. Does that sound right to everybody? Oh, I thought it was five. Actually, one, two, is it one, two, five, and seven? Yeah. I, I thought it, it, it says four on the board. It says four on the board, but it says five and eight. And it says five Let's go five. So, come on. How about this? Four or five? Are you happy with that? Yeah. I don't want to look at it now, and I might have this time to misread it, but they're both, they're all pretty good questions. So that'll be due on, that'll be due tomorrow. I'm getting back in the swing of things too. Swing of things too, well, am I still on? Yes. And people can chat publicly with me. Yeah, that's what it says on YouTube. So last year when I was doing this, I would get weird messages from people. <laughs> I mean like, not in my class. It was shocking how many people watched my class. Huh? Yeah. Now, a lot of uh, students from other other um, schools, um, just adults. I had this this guy from Kuwait or uh, not Kuwait, uh, uh, Dubai would watch me almost every day. That's cool though. Yeah. So I assume you're typing in the assignment. No, I'm actually looking for your YouTube channel. I'm kind of interested. Okay, we're not gonna do it now though. Okay. Now, you don't do that now. But please, when you go to my, um, when you're gonna be gone on my YouTube channel, which is Jay Partridge's YouTube channel, and um, to get a notification, you have to subscribe. No, I'm not monetizing it. So, <laughs> I should, no, that would be unethical. All right, so, a couple things real fast. I'll explain this thing, this packet I handed out here, this is a bunch of stuff. This goes all the way through the Revolutionary War. And so I put a lot of things through here, and there's a map, and a, uh, um, a couple reading things, and I just kind of put it all together so you have it. It'll be for the next uh, few weeks. And a couple things you, you do have to read. Some of the most important laws in history. So, so does everyone have this? Okay. So it's called the fornication laws. And there are three fornication, well actually, I took one out. So two fornication laws, but they're incredibly important but one of the most important laws in the history of the world. And I'm not making that up, it comes from colonial Virginia, I'm not exaggerating at all, is the Negro Women's Children Law. Now it says 1691, but actually the first one was written in 1671. Okay, I changed master and study off this master, very comfortable, but it's not good to talk in, so. Taking my mask off. Yes, I do have a face. Okay. By the way, I found out with a paper mask, take them out. 
and let them sit for a while before you put them on. Have you noticed how if you put a paper mask on, what happens when it's fresh out of the box or anything like that? They have a, they don't s smell good. <laughs> Air them out. There's my advice. Write that down. Okay, so the fornication laws. And you have to read these laws. But the most important law is a very short little law. Now, this was written in the Virginia House of Burgesses in the what heck, 17th century law. Now, law to this day is always going to be very complex and hard to read. And yes, that's on purpose. But this law, you have to read and you have the directions on top. Just underline on this sheet. Underline it says right on top. Examples how this is going to do to draw a wedge between the classes and the races. I can't even begin to tell you what a big deal this law will be. So I'll get to it, but I got to talk a little bit about Virginia. Some of this will be repeat what you read in the book, but I'm trying to set up a system or a series of events that you could replicate all throughout the colonies. I should add, do you know what fornication is? Some of you might know. So fornication is a very archaic term, and in this context, in the 17th century, it implies it is a crime, and what it means is sex outside of marriage. That's what it's talking about. So it's talking about here, sex between the masters and servants. Now servants are indentured servants and slaves. Male, master, female, servant. Very important to understand that that concept and what was going on. So it talks about children being born out of wedlock. And these are one of the things that combined with a series of events called Bacon Rebellion will literally change everything. That is one of the few times we can talk about fornication. So moving on. So we are going to do a few notes. So this one you read on your own. Please have this. I want you to read all of them, but have this part read for tomorrow. The first one. It's just a little paragraph. And if you open up, there'll be a map that we do down the road. I'm taking the maps. Uh, a couple of worksheets we're going to watch. A uh, video in class. You know, that kind of thing. Sound good? Oh, and then Federalist number 10. So there's a lot of stuff. You just get down the road. I just gave it all to you once. Now, let's go ahead and take your notebook out. We're going to do a couple notes in here. And this is what I do. I set the desk and <laughs> no, one has no one has chatted with me yet. They don't know I'm live yet. Sorry, I'm just trying to play with the time. Okay, now, my new notes in class. So this is, it says 16th century England, but what I'm talking about is for this is what I just today, Virginia College. And I have a bunch of stuff on the Massachusetts and things like that, but I'm only going to do Virginia in class in any, any detail. And I normally, when I would do notes in class for years, many years, I use PowerPoints a lot of times just, I like the pictures. I show pictures and I show maps. And I love doing that. Sometimes I do the board, change the page, I can write stuff and scroll over the board and draw pictures. I spent a lot of time this summer changing everything to PowerPoint because I think you know why. If we are all of a sudden out of school, back at home, drawing on the board didn't work very well for my house. I guess I can get like a little whiteboard and write things, but it didn't quite work. So I, I transferred a bunch of this. So like, for example, this I was done on the board, but now I've changed it this year. And what I do, whether it be on the board, so maybe we'll go back to that, so I'll do some more on the board, or PowerPoint. I just simply put down some bullet points. I don't write very much down. Just a few things. It is your job, your duty in class to add to that, embellish it by what I am adding. And there'll be some stuff where I duplicate from the book, duplicate from the book, but I do not lecture from the book at all. I do not do that. I add uh, material from all sorts of different sources that I have, and I'm always trying to relate it to the, to the present, to what's going on now. And so when I add something here, it's your job to add it, embellish it, and get it down in your notes the way that you can use it. I know you all have a shorthand that you use. So please use that. And so let's go ahead and get started. And so let's talk just very quickly about 16th century Britain. 
And that to be clear about Britain was a weak, actually, I'm saying Britain in the 16th century, it's more England. Scotland was independent, Wales had been conquered, but Britain was poor, England was poor, it was weak, it did have uh, a small fleet, but it was a poor country. It didn't have a lot. They had been gone through um, almost constant war with France. They were weak. The powerful country, Spain. Spain, one of the first real nations, and it was under the Habsburg monarchy, but all this area in gold, that's New Spain. And I think I mentioned this last week, but if I didn't, I know I mentioned it in one of my classes, but Spain was able to pull out enough gold from the New World that they doubled the amount of gold, doubled it, in Europe. Prices went up, there was inflation, Spain became incredibly powerful. In fact, the Habsburg monarch, Charles V was the king of Spain, he also was the monarch of Austria and the Habsburg, or the Holy Roman Empire, which is all this area here, a big hunk of Italy, a massive empire. More money than they knew what to do with. So what did they do with it? They went on a series of essentially crusades against the Ottoman Turks and the Muslims. They went to war almost constantly across Europe. And what happened to their fortune? In 100 years, Spain would be weak, and they would blow it all, combined with the fact that they only let Catholics into New Spain. There's a limited number of Catholics. Not that many could come over. And by limiting the Catholics, except for slaves, but remember, slaves were heathens. Therefore, they could justify enslaving them. Since they weren't Christian, they could enslave them. Didn't mean they didn't enslave Christians, but that's another story. It limited the number of people colonists New Spain had. And so Britain would take advantage of that. I showed you that Britain would hire pirates called privateers to stop the Spanish fleet. We'll talk more about this later. Britain would begin to steal from them, peck away at them. New Spain by 1700 would be a weak, decrepit kingdom. In 200 years, they would go from being the richest place in Europe, in fact, the second richest empire probably in the world after China, and would be weak blow it all for 200 years, all their wealth. China would do it another 100 years later, and they would blow a combination of a number of things, but they would become weak. That might be a warning for us. And Britain, therefore, would improvise. Pirates, they would do things on the fly, figure out ways to make a colonial empire on the cheap. They, too, would try to find ways to get gold to match the Spanish. And they would allow all Europeans by allowing all Europeans, their numbers would be greater. That would be decisive on why the United States is a country. Decisive. By the way, I didn't. And so with that, we mentioned Roland like Island, so we're not going to talk about it in class. We just talked about when I was answering the question about it, so we're not going to go through that. We're going to get to the Chesapeake Colony, specifically Virginia. Sorry, I got to see something. Okay. I'm not sure you got to cover the nose. I know these slides. I hate it too. So, the Chesapeake Colonies. And we're talking about the colonies here on the Chesapeake River. There were very unique colonial structures, which we'll talk about more because. The way these colonies started, the way these colonies started was set a legacy that if you go there today, they still have that legacy. Here, kind of this aristocratic, uh, they try to form like the, um, the, people, the first people who came there were a bunch of sons of gentlemen, of noblemen, who try to make their own English countryside. So you have that feeling there. If you go to Virginia, Rural Virginia, you'll know what I mean. This was a slave kingdom. New England, 
People went there for the idea that we're going to create a, a country, a colony together, and they had much more of an idea for the common good. And by the way, we get this area, the generic name of the Middle Atlantic. Clever name, isn't it? Because it's kind of in the middle between New England and Virginia. Middle Atlantic. That's how they came up with, you've all heard the term Middle East. Which, if you're in the Middle East, as we call it, that makes no sense to them there. Britain looked at it as the East was China. So what's in the middle? The Middle East. Makes no sense to anybody else, but that's what Britain did, and we still have it. Sometimes you see it called, they called it the Near East. Okay, so, Chesapeake Colonies, right here. In many ways, this would create the structure of the early United States and the foundation of the American economy. So here I get to this, Jamestown. Jamestown was the first British colony that survived. I did not put down the year because, like I told you, I was doing this, kind of going through stuff this summer, and so I wasn't quite thinking. But 1607, and a company was chartered, which meant a contract called the Virginia Company of London. And they would start the colony in Jamestown. Yeah. So is Jamestown in the Yes. In fact, it's the only one we're really going to talk about. It's Virginia, Maryland, and Delaware. But Virginia was the key. I mean, the rest of them, I know I had a couple things in the notes, but right here. And here's an advertisement for people to try to colonize at Jamestown. And I love this for lots of reasons, but you also notice, see the printing press? That's an S. The S is kind of look like Fs. In fact, that looks like something we should be very careful about saying in class. <laughs> but instead, it says such. Then why is the S and the S? I know. It's, sometimes it would do that just for the first letter. Sometimes they do it when there's a double S. It we, would be basically the printer would have their dis discretion. This is pre-dictionary. There's no spelling. In fact, written languages as we know it, the common vernacular, was literally just being created in the 150 years before this. So this is all new. It's, it's pretty cool when you look at it that way. This is what we call a joint stock company. Now, joint stock companies have existed before. In fact, there are rolling joint stock companies. But this is something that the Dutch were doing. And who owns a joint stock company? Yeah. Yeah, investors. We call them shareholders. And, or stockholders, you'll hear. They would buy a share. And let's say you own 10% of the London company. You would get 10% of the profits. And this is a precursor to what type of company? The companies that dominate the world today. Little. I'm looking around, only a few people are advertising corporations today. Oh my god, what's your sugar? Oh, you're advertising London! <laughs> yes, our first period, I had two people with big sweatshirts. Just tell you that the, the power of a corporation that people will actually be paid to advertise. My shirt. And so with that, we all it's but it was a way to do it on the cheap. If Britain would have paid for this colony themselves, if they paid for themselves, they might lose everything. But if they let investors do it, they'll come colonize it and then Britain would tax it. They would tax it. And if it fails, the stockholders are out. That's why they had to have advertisement to try to convince people that they're going to get rich if they go. And how does a corporation work or a joint stock company? They get a contract. Another word for a contract is a royal charter. And like I said, this is so they can do it on the cheap. We'll give them a contract. We'll say, you get this land. You must colonize it. You must be under the British flag, <coughs> the English flag. The Union Jack, it's kind of covered up by the map. You see the fourth flag right there, the Union Jack? 
that had just been created. Literally just been created. That bad. And do it on the cheap. Improvise. And then they would tax it. So we got the Chesapeake Bay. Why the Chesapeake Bay? It's far from New Spain, which is down here, and it's protected from storms. Roanoke was on an island. Got battered by every storm that went through. Terrible place for a home. So they got this land claim, and three ships went sailing up here. I'm going to go forward a little bit because what Britain did, the charter is they gave them a land claim. That's what I put claims. They gave all these colonies a contract. Maryland colony, Massachusetts colony, Plymouth colony, and a land claim. It doesn't mean they own the land. The government of Britain just says, we give you all the land that went from here, between these two latitude lines, to the Pacific. No, they did not bother to ask the people who lived there. They never said, oh, you're not part of Britain. It's a claim. And the French claimed this. They gave them land that the Spanish claimed. And this ram right here that Virginia got, actually, the original charter went almost to here. So Virginia claimed this. Massachusetts claimed this. New Jersey claimed this. New York claimed this. Along with France, Britain, and everybody else. See all these conflicting land claims? They just said, it's all yours. They figure we'll worry about it later. You got money to make. Worry about it later. So back to this. How they sold it was, they convinced everybody it's mounds of gold. There's gold everywhere. The Spanish brought all this gold back. The new world must be literally made of gold. And they convinced people those who would get on the, these ships, that you will find mountains of gold, and you will make your fortune, and you can live like an English country gentleman and lead that life of luxury. That was the goal of all of them, to have that little piece of land, and maybe someday you can build your mansion, an English country home. If you go to the south of the United States and see the mansions on those big slave labor camps, they're called plantations, they're copied almost directly from English country homes. That's what they wanted to be. That's what they wanted. So they assumed there'd be mounds of gold and they could buy it. Now, if this was an organized trip, they'd have carpenters and soldiers and farmers, make sense? But this wasn't. They were trying to convince people you're gonna get rich. And so a lot of them were, oh, this is a really cool picture about 1630, from a book that was made. This is the illustration of the Chesapeake, and there's St. James. I think that's a really cool picture. The big ships and massive trees. So 144 colonists, and we're coming to what's called the starving time, went up on the three ships, the Susan Constant, the Discovery, and the Good Speed. Three ships. 144 colonists went up the river and so working pay all right. Most of them were dandies. The dandies were the second or third sons of noblemen. Who inherited inherited hard to talk up because you mass on. I'm doing okay, but how muffled am I? Can you kind of understand me? Who inherited, inherited the land, the estate of a noble? Yeah, the firstborn, it's called primogenitor, the firstborn son. So what's the second or third son going to do? That's why so many would join, like, the priesthood. I don't think in the priesthood house they, they're going to devote their life to help other people. No, that was, you know, most of them thought, okay, it's a, a life where they could become uh, rich, they can enter the church. There's a lot of uh, scams going on. Or they join the military. They become an officer in the army, or they become uh, in the navy, maybe get a fortune that way. So these are all second or third sons thinking, 
This is how I'll get my country and state. This is how I'll do it. And so they were totally unprepared. And so that summer, and it had to be late summer when they could make that trip. Late summer, when they sail up the James Estuary. You know what an estuary is? An estuary is a river right next to the ocean that is still affected by the tides. And so it's the James right here has its peninsula, the York uh, River's right here named after King James. By the way, Virginia is named after whom? Yeah? Isn't it Queen Elizabeth? But she had, she, part of her uh, aura was that she was the Virgin Queen, because she was not married yet. They kind of set this whole mythology about it. But the tides come in. The water is very brackish, salty. And so you got to get up the river a little bit. It's really swampy here. There's not really good agricultural land to up here. But they sail up the James River. Sunny day. Three ships, which hard to sail. You have to kind of tap really sharp. They went at low tide. Or as they were going, the tide went down. And as it covered on both, there's kind of a the river and then sandy beaches and then swamp. Marshland. Tide went down, uncovered sandy beaches. Sandy. I said that weird. Sandy beaches on a sunny day. What does sand look like on a sunny day? Coal. They're rich. All these dandies dumped out their barrels of supply. That's how they kept these in a barrel. They dumped it out to rot in the sun. And they got shovels and started shoveling sand into their barrels. That was their fortune that they're going to send back to Britain. And they put it on board the ship, and all three ships went back to Britain, filled to the brim with sand. I was wondering what it must have been like when they got these ships back to Portsmouth or wherever, like sand. Why did they send the sand? What happened to the settlers? Half. Half of them died. Let's get back to, so I already mentioned the swamp. Half of them died. They did enslave some of the local tribes. Now, the tribes that were there had been devastated by disease. And so there weren't very many, and there was a swamp. It wasn't good for agriculture. The tribe, before the Europeans arrived, they were farmers. They grew beans, maize, I know you know what maize is. We all call it corn. I call it corn. But if you're British, in Britain, the corn is, is or corn are the seed from any, any um, crops that come from grass. So like wheat, those seeds, that's corn. Rye is corn. It's just, it's all corn. So maize is, a, it's related, but maize is something particular. And I'll be a, Maize and potatoes would change everything. We'll actually come back to that. But they did, um, there were farmers, but not many lived there. They enslaved some because that's what the Spanish did, and they were heathens, and they were desperate. But they died. This is a very stylized picture of them building uh, Jamestown. By the way, they all had to have a wall in case the Spanish came up and attacked. Had to have a wall. And like I said before, there was no real leader. There was no skills. It was a disaster. The next year, 1608, two ships arrived filled with more dandies. And they came to these starving remnants of people there. And the first thing those dandies did on the second trip was to do what? Yes, they actually did. And they were telling them, no, it's sick. But then they figured it out. And they thought, you're trying to hide our fortune from us. And they did the same thing. 1610 would be known as the starving time. The winter 1609-1610, they nearly all starved. Only a few left survived. In fact, only 38 survived. Out of the, by then, over 300 people had come to colonize. Only 38 survived. That picture, OK, this was done from a manuscript from about 1670. But it's trying to show a mother protecting her hovel, which would think of more of a hut. 
So that's much nicer than what it actually was, or at least looks nicer. And she's defending her from her son that just died. And what's happening? Yeah, they're coming to eat with son. Yeah, they resort to cannibalism. In 1610, when the ships arrived, they found crazed people gnawing on human bones trying to get the marrow off. That's what they found. That's how bad it got there. In fact, the local tribes were like, like the whole house, these guys aren't going anywhere. Now, here's the thing, there wasn't gold. This thing wasn't making it at all. They were broke. I'm not gonna talk about in class, I put a slide in here. Oh, I do have to mention this. The local Powhatan tribes nearby, when the Virginians look like they're gonna make it, they begin to trade with them. Why? They looked to the English, and they saw the English, they could help us with our enemies, tribes in the interior. They thought, okay, we'll use the English. This is one of these situations that'll happen a number of times in history. Bad move. Bad move. Because what are the English going to do as soon as they can? We'll take everything you have. So here's a very stylized picture of a Powhatan, but I like this one. This one was done, this was 1640s. Powhatans, English. This is probably Captain Smith, or one of these is Captain Smith. But look how they draw the Powhatans. Now, they've been devastated by disease, but those who survived just absolutely um, wow the English. They draw them big, muscular. They've never seen people so healthy, the English. But that was their doom. They were so healthy because they didn't have the same diseases. Ironically, just ravaged. They just never seen anything like that. And so you, they really draw them like that. Even though they're all doomed. It's, it's uh, a little tragedy. We're not going to talk about John Smith. John Smith, oh, don't worry about that. We're going to jump right to this. What saved Jamestown was tobacco. 1612, tobacco was introduced. Tobacco only grows in a very narrow latitude, basically from Virginia down to North Carolina to the Mississippi. Today, most of the tobacco is grown in Louisville, Virginia, North Carolina, and Kentucky. But John Rolfe, and I love this picture, the wooden etching of John Rolfe with the pipe. He was the first one to start cultivating tobacco. And this would be their goal. This addictive drug they could sell and make Virginia colony work and tobacco that would form the background. And how they cultivate it would form the background of the colonies and then the new United States. And I'll mention this again, but if you go to, the US, uh, to Washington, D.C., many of the buildings, especially ones that were made uh, before 1850, on the sides are carved, it looks like flowers. They're tobacco leaves to show the importance of tobacco and therefore slavery. But that's another story we'll get to tomorrow. 500,000 bushels of tobacco is a significant amount, or barrel. I mean, a bushel of tobacco is something like a quarter acre, because dry tobacco compresses down. That's a lot of cultivation. And so here, early cultivation, the barrels, the pipe, they would smoke it or they would grind it up and snort it, called snuff. Yeah, and it would eat the septum of your nose. It was pretty rough stuff. But it's an addictive drug. And yes, it worked. Boy, the colonies became, okay, not rich overnight. And, <coughs> excuse me, I think I told you this on, did I tell you on Thursday I have a little allergy? And that kind of comes going. Know exactly sure what it is, but I occasionally cough. I hope it's not something else, but I am wearing a mask. Okay, so, and it would be because of tobacco, a political marriage would happen between the Powhatans and Virginians. 
Roth would marry, okay, I'm an English speaker. I see Mato Matoaka. Does that sound pretty good? The English would butcher this into Pocahontas. The English would butcher all kinds of things. We'll get to more examples. But people speak different languages and try to do it phonetically. He's got a couple pictures of Pocahontas, but she would marry John Rolfe. She was the daughter of a very prominent member of the Bullhoutons. Here is supposedly a picture of her saving John Smith. That's purely made up garbage. But here they took her back as kind of a publicity tour to England. There she is meeting King James. This was done in 16. 15 to publicize her coming to England. She died of disease and is buried at St. George's Church in her life. But that's where Pocahontas comes in, a political marriage. But also shows what's happened, how disease ravaged them. But soon we call plantations, slave labor camps, we'll come back to that. And tobacco cultivation will have a problem. The English style of plant, the European style, and all of you, when you think of a farm, you think of when the bell rings. Because when the bell rings, you're going to leave. I'm, I'm getting back into the swing of things. I know you will, too. I'm going to see all of you tomorrow, won't I? And then starting, and then Thursday and Friday, I will broadcast. And now it seems like I got it working right. Sound good? How are things going? Is it getting, it's still weird, but... Choice, right? Let's hope we stay here. All right, goodbye, everybody. Have a good day.